extinction age is and how this uh, surviving extinction is possible. And today we have um, our brother, Peter Barras. He's uh, now a familiar face to global peace. Very happy to see you, Peter. <laughs> and um, uh, Peter Barras, uh, who is based in Vermont, USA, um, is actually a very multi-talented person. Um, as we can see, um, that um, he's first of all a student of both Tagore, Tagore and Gandhi. Oh, but he's I, must, also... I must correct. <laughs> great, great. That was a and visitor you... to my right. house when I was in, in my teenage years. Lovely. A friend of my mother's who told me about being a student of both Tagore and Gandhi. <laughs> great, I see. And then he's, of course, also a musician who also has worked in uh, timber construction, even beekeeping, mm -hmm. and uh, also in technology, also developed a pricing software that I'm sure we'll talk about. And um, uh, that's a so software for small uh, businesses. And he has published quite uh, widely on human condition and its uh, possibilities. And so today we are going to hear a lot about your experience. We thank you very much indeed for joining us and especially today for giving us a talk. I welcome everybody on this call. It's nice to see you all. Um, and as always, we are going to um, mute our microphones and give you uh, the floor, Peter, to proceed. And after the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. So thank you very much indeed. Peter, you are welcome. You can also share your screen. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Mutalema. Um, that song always makes me cry. <sighs> All right. Well, I'll start with a, with a bunch of slides which is probably a terrible thing to do to people. In the context of development and peace in Africa, my first encounter was in 1963. My father exchanged places with a professor, Mark Chijioke, at Omadu Bello University in Northern Nigeria. I attended a local school as part of the British colonial missionary school system One day, I arrived early in the morning to find smoke pouring out of under the lid of my desk. Back home, that would have meant that somebody was playing a nasty joke. And it was probably already sprung. So whatever would unfold next was guaranteed to define me for the rest of my stay. My only hope lay in seeing the underlying, underlying intention early and forestalling whatever humiliation was about to fall. Nobody else was in the classroom yet. I lifted the lid of my desk, saw a steaming bundle of damp green leaves sitting on the books. I picked up the top book, and slid along the bench, tipped the bundle out the window. There was just an opening. There was no glass in the window out onto the ground behind the building. I was to learn much later that a boy named Owolowo had risen several hours before dawn, sneaked out of the dormitory and ran to town barefoot and bought the most delicious treat that he could get with his pocket money for the month. It was a boarding school. I was one of the day students. He ran back through the night, regardless of hyenas and cobras, and placed it on my school books, fresh and hot still. Small, shy Owolowo had risked everything, humiliation, the hopes of the entire village, his future, quite possibly his life, at least a beating, administered by Mr. Kalajai, also known as Baba, as in 
Papa is coming. He was the vice principal. And he ruled with an iron fist. Allora, quanto costa? Ok, grazie. I felt that sad and guilty for the misunderstanding for years, but it wasn't a misunderstanding. That word is really a stepping stone over deeper questions. It was a paradigm shift. I had experienced this before as a young child. In 1953, my seven-year-old big brother was still not allowed near the river without his faded orange life jacket. He couldn't swim, so it had kept him afloat since he was five years old. And then when the grown-ups came down to the dock, we could shed all these heavy canvas life jackets. And one afternoon, somebody kicked it off into the water, and we watched it as it sank like a stone. In a paradigm shift, the world we've relied upon no longer exists. It is disorienting, like a phantom stair step, or thrown into the unknown, stumbling, flailing arms, not knowing which way is up. If we drove a car into the river, we would step on the brakes, the car would keep sinking. Exactly this kind of change has now happened globally at unprecedented scale. The communications networks have gone super critical. I'll go into that a little bit later. But there is a phase change in networks, which is much like when water turns to ice. Billions of us are connected to each other now on a scale we can't imagine. Face to face. There's a problem. Our connections are made possible and maintained by a parasitic system. It exploits everything about our private lives, our hopes and fears, our susceptibilities. It grows bloated on our energy, our time, our autonomy. We're beginning to understand how our far-flung new communities are set out as bait. It's fair to ask, am I reliving an old trauma here, discovering my life vest has negative buoyancy, seeing the steam rising from the lid of my desk? I have no answer to this pointed question, but I'm willing to leave it open and explore the implications of a newly connected humanity as we continue operating systems that are obsolete and toxic. It's been about 20 years since our life jackets began to drag us under. The great promise of the internet raised serious hopes of worldwide peace and prosperity. Some of you may remember. <laughs> the possibilities were staggering for peace and justice and public health and hunger and poverty. But it did not change the economic system under which it would have to attract investment or die. This, by the way, refers to the what Howard Richards calls the basic cultural structures. Uh, we think of it as natural law, but it is not. Accordingly, such hopes became dreams and were quickly pushed aside in the quest for profit. When the networks reached what scientists call supercritical levels of interconnection, information could not compete with attention. Now the power derived from control of information was nothing as compared to the power of attention. Three steps, information, opinion, action, are reduced to two, attention, action. Social media platforms had relied on advertising to pay for free services. But the newspaper business model didn't work online. Even targeted ads failed. The cash was flowing the wrong way. The most lucrative resource was no longer the totality of all human knowledge, but the minute details of our private lives. 
The search engines were slammed into reverse. A new extraction industry sprang up, mining the trivial data provided by our mouse clicks, locations, search histories, reading habits, likes, and friends. The raw ore was the momentary attention of millions of users scraped up every second. The best attractant is fear. The rise of authoritarian demagogues and random mass shootings was inevitable. Where once information could inform public opinion, sometimes leading to action, now spectacle drove almost instantaneous public reaction. A presidential candidate could boast of assaulting women with impunity at the height of a successful campaign and rise in the polls. People could be convinced that basic hygienic practice established for a century was a hoax. The press jumped right into bed with government as revealed recently in the Twitter files, a very interesting story that's a little bit hard to find because it's inconvenient for power. Unprecedented wealth inequality continues now rising exponentially. Social fragmentation soon followed. The internet is fully colonized. I'll pause for a second. Uh, here I am, the descendant of uh, predominantly British or Scottish uh, immigrants in the 1600s to the continental United States. Uh, my family has had its ups and downs, but pretty much on the ups. Military men, medical, legal, and in later generations, academics. But certainly deeply enmeshed in the colonial project. And one branch of my family included the Lord High Chancellor of England, uh, who managed the coronation of Elizabeth, uh, a person that I've dined with in the House of Lords on one memorable occasion. Social anxiety, and you know, so I say this because here I am, I'm talking to African peace initiatives, uh, telling them about colonialism, which is uh, laughable. I should be a student. Uh, social anxiety had long been a force multiplier for advertising. Anxious people often go shopping. Users had been flooded with micro impressions of body image, social status, personal inadequacy, and ambient anxiety for decades. So as we adopted this artifact with all these screens, we were exposed to tiny subliminal images uh, indicating that we were found wanting, basically, and should be very afraid. Over the years, these corner of the eye experiences became more and more personalized and began to shape and color our individualized worlds. So now we began to be separated into markets. First, we were demographics. We were white people and black people and rich people and middle class people and so on. But the markets that we were part of shrunk and now were markets of one. The entire marketing industry is aimed at me, tailored to fit what it thinks that I'm going to respond to. Our screens became the paraphernalia of addiction and yielded up our private lives as de facto intellectual property to the providers. 
libraries of books, media, databases, uh, medicine, science, the arts, the humanities, everything we would want in a comprehensive library lost their market value, displaced by the trillions of data points on individual users, which could reveal not only their hopes and fears, but their likely responses to specific events, their susceptibilities. The balance of power tilted. Then it became possible not only to predict, but to direct our behavior. The major social platforms took full advantage of an unknowing public. Now targeted ads had a completely different purpose. They're no longer trying to sell you something. They're trying to extract every bit of information about you. We began to withdraw into isolation and general distrust. So this is a continuation of the colonial project. Meantime, almost completely unnoticed in the global north, the massive colonial wealth extraction that empowered the industrial age had left millions displaced and desperate. And it also fueled the accelerating ecological disaster that forced mass migrations. Populations now fleeing for safety are met with violence by the former colonial powers that had made their homelands untenable in the first place. The colonial extraction operation didn't end in the 1960s with independence. I was in Nigeria just four years after they officially were independent. The now constant resource uh, wars. Uh, the now constant resource wars decimating former colonies in Western Asia have spread to Eastern Europe. A struggle for global hegemony has reached the brink of nuclear cataclysm. Looking from a broader context, all of this may be seen as just one of many accelerating threats to humanity and the biosphere. Climate change is a deceptive name for a complex system of complex systems. A constellation of looming planet-wide disasters converging on a point in time and space beyond which life cannot continue. The greater context must be addressed effectively before any of the interrelated acute emergencies, such as weather events, pandemics, wars, displacements, and famines, can be mitigated successfully. Otherwise, our responses amount to crisis interventions that do not reach underlying causes of our deadly trajectory. We are now so distracted and incoherent, this so-called meta-crisis seems beyond our capacities. The churning catastrophe that appears to us as droughts, storms, floods, wildfires, rising seas, species extinctions, crop failures, and pandemic diseases is so interrelated as to present irreducible problems, any solution to which, like the Rubik's Cube puzzle, disrupt others. The Club of Rome explained this in the book Limits to Growth in the 1960s. They used the word exponential over 80 times. It was much longer than an 80-page book. Unfortunately, their conclusions were used as scare tactics about population and the rest ignored. The more we learn about conditions, the more entangled our situation appears. Each phenomenon is interrelated within a network of others. To cite just one example, fertility is declining while random violence seems to rise. Both have been correlated with toxic industrial byproducts on the endocrine system. I'm sorry, the impact on the endocrine system. A similar correlation occurred with lead and paint when it was banned in about 1978, violent crime dropped. New chemicals known as hormone disruptor compounds are pervasive from the mountaintops to the ocean floor and every cell in our bodies. Only recently, PFOA forever chemicals have been added to the growing list, and yet their danger is still denied 
by regulatory agencies and the corporations that control them. After generations of colonialism, the industries producing these toxins are still focused on profit, oblivious to the common good. The underlying, and by the way, I have a, a sort of a blame tone on this, but this is systemic. This is structural. This is not some evil mastermind at work. The underlying economic logic is structurally self-propagating and self-protective and now fully self-destructive. Even the legal system constrains enterprises to enhance shareholder value without limits. The foregoing is but a small sampling of our real condition as a species and our obsolete, collapsing, deeply entangled, and structurally toxic life support systems, each with a logarithmically expanding impact in a finite world. Today, despair. But I'm, that's a delightful sound. I haven't heard that sound in a long time. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, that's perfectly fine. I, I think I'm sitting on the veranda underneath a gorilla tree. Today, despair is a sign of mental health. My late father used to have a nightmare in which everyone was on a fast train having a party and he could see a ravine ahead, the bridge gone. He couldn't get past the happy crowd to tell the engineer to stop the train. The conclusion of my explorations over more than five decades is this. Humanity's in a mess from our collective behavior. Our smallest actions multiplied by our numbers over at least several centuries. Since behavior is linked to perception and not always to reality, our collective actions can be self-destructive. We made this mess, not with malice of forethought, but with the power of cultural selection. Everything in blue, I have more text on if we, if we need it. <laughs> So, cultural selection is a term that was uh, given to me by Robert Pollock, who's a dean of Columbia University. I attribute humanity's predicament to collective behaviors that seem intractable, but I do not accept inevitability. The neurological, the neurobiological correlation of our worldview with our response means our response is consistent with experience even if our experience is not direct. This model locates the origins of our self-destruction where we may possibly be able to get a grip. In other words, I'm ascribing our collective suicidal behavior to something that we may have access to. It's a little tricky. Eventually, I came, to embrace, I came to embrace uncertainty. This was a kind of surrender. I had to relinquish unspoken assumptions and admit a terrifying truth. I had to let go of an assumed identity, that of an outsider, an innocent just passing through, and to realize nobody was deceived but myself. That moment, I became an earthling and accepted responsibility. Learning is about what I wasn't aware that I didn't know. This has been uh, made much of in all quarters, but basically what matters is what we don't know that we don't know. We're not a blank slate. Learning sometimes occurs as a violent upheaval new ways in which to see and understand life are accompanied by new ways of being and action. That's a correlation that's hardwired in human brains, apparently. How we see and understand life 
and how we respond to it don't even involve thought. It's completely automatic. Can this scale up to a collective worldview and new collective behaviors? In other words, can we change the way that we see and understand life and invoke new behaviors? In particular, the indigenous worldview as described by Four Arrows and Darsha Narvaez in a book they just published called Restoring the Kinship Worldview. By the way, I'll provide you with a bibliography. Um, it's not quite complete, so I'll send it by email before you get this out. I might be able to put some of it in the chat. Also, Evelyn Lindner, Gavin Anderson, F. Sultan Somji, Lugi Watsyongo. I'm going to learn to pronounce that name correctly. Hector Aristizabo and others. The kinship worldview includes direct relationship with all of life, extending to infinity. Unlike the world we know as normal, this is not a passive, but an active state of being. It's not fixed. It does not persist. It is continuing, emergent, self-organizing, moment-to-moment co-creation. While this is not the way all of us live our lives, it may be mastered like riding a bicycle. And if so, can this happen at scale? And can this scale be reached in time to shift our trajectory? I want to suggest that it can. Could there be any good news? My answer is yes. It may have access to a viable future. A few points about that. All fighting is now collectively suicidal. Whatever the reasons, war is obsolete. By the way, I have studied violence very, very closely in a form of Japanese martial arts um, for 40 years now. So I have a, a personal basis for the statement. I began that training because of my, actually I was a conscientious objector and refused to go to war when uh, I was drafted for Vietnam. I spent four years working in hospital operating rooms as an alternative. Answers will not be where we look and will not take any familiar form in other words, we do everything we do out of past. And what we face is unprecedented. Our survival will only be visible in the flowing ephemeral in between in the encounter that we are with life. That last may be an incomprehensible statement. This may be a characteristic the fullness of reality can't be tied up in a neat package, but only glimpsed. Most of what will prevent our extinction must already have been going on beneath our notice, beyond our ken, for a long time now, unrecognized. If that's not the case, then I'm just moving my mouth and making noises while we go into the sun. <laughs> Uh, surely I'm not the only one that thinks we're going to be okay. The mere fact that I'm speaking about extinction this way indicates there must be millions of other people focused on the same object. It's not important that they find the right view, just that sober awareness is finally dawning. There's one key element in all this right now, it is the most sought after source of power and the engine of commerce. It's also one essential component of the world economic system that you own outright. It is your non-transferable birthright. The only way it can be neutralized is for you to withhold it. And you can withhold it by being distracted too. 
a key element is your attention. It may be that that's all we are, is moments of attention. Well, mass attention is focused for just a moment on the same object. Behavioral surplus is collected and stored and sorted. That's a term of Shoshana Zuboff, who produced a magnificent work called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. Uh, from which granular data points can be gleaned, such search history, demographics, age, much, much more. Algorithms are trained and refined and fed recursively back into the mining machinery. So the more the social media read us, the better they're targeting. There's so much data. It's a simple matter to derive almost any information down to individual susceptibilities, hopes, and fears. It is also easy to manipulate a reliable percentage of the public into action, consistent with manufactured perceptions. Enough to sell cars and beer, enough to shift a vote or start a war. Our behavior is the natural outcome of the way in which we perceive and comprehend life. Our behavior is tightly correlated to perception, not always reality. That's why our perceptions are so relentlessly assaulted every moment from our screens, in our media, even in our educational systems. It is as if we were infested with a parasite that feeds on our attention, herding us like farm animals, harnessing us to mining equipment. This is my little joke. I don't really believe in the matrix. <laughs> we know it is possible to experience and comprehend life in ways that correlate to restorative and responsible behavior. It's possible to speak new ways of being and acting. It must also be possible collectively. If so, humanity could shift from self-destructive to nurturant, sustaining behaviors in no time at all. The impacts of such a global transformation are, of course, incalculable and profound, but possible. The obvious alternative is predictable. We may begin by recognizing this obsolescence, how far short of what is really possible our global system falls, how unnecessary it really is to leave nearly a quarter of us dying of starvation, disease, and endless organized violence. We have sufficient communications and sufficient networks right now to recognize this obsolescence and mass. When we do, collectively, the appropriate restoration of balance may come without effort. It could happen today. I'll end with this quote from a friend of mine. Obsolete power corrupts obsoletely. Now, that's the end of all the talking from me. <laughs> I have uh, some little demonstrations having to do with the network of catastrophes that we need to face. And uh, if we have time, uh, happy to have questions whenever you like. Thank you very much indeed, Peter, for this wonderful presentation. Now I think the attention age is uh, uh, familiar to most of us. I, I think all of us. And um, I would like now to ask um, the participants uh, who are in this call to ask questions or make comments on this presentation. Janet, you would like to begin? Sure, yes, why please. not? Why not? Maybe at the end, I'd like to say something else. Hello, Peter. Very good to see Hi. you. Yeah. We know each other through the Human Dignity Humiliation Studies Network, 
but rarely have I been able to hear you say so much. <laughs> and uh, I was very, really moved. The key point, the pinnacle of what you said is that all conflict now, war and conflict and violence are obsolete because we need, I think you're saying, or I understand, we need to work together to change. And I'd like to hear if you could expound a bit more on the constructive, creative, constructive, communicative uh, moves that we would need to make, I'd be most interested. Thank you. Well, how good to see you. Um, the, you know, just just one thing. Just think about uh, Zoom conferences. I don't know the statistics on this, but imagine there are maybe a billion people who are looking at faces in real time. And imagine what what happens with brains when they are face to face. There's been a lot of work on this, but none of it seems to me has noticed that the scale is something that's never happened in human history. A billion people in one space. Now, we only see 10 or 15 or 20 of them or 500 of them at a time, but this is going on 24 seven around the world now. It's, it has to be changing us. It, it has changed us. Uh, if it dropped out of existence, it would be devastating. This is just one of, there, you know, there's so much noise now that you can't even bother to look at this stuff. But when you do, you see that most people are aware that we're in trouble. And most people are aware that the noise is noise. That's a big beginning right there. And that can also uh, accelerate the way all these terrible things are accelerating. And we, w we wouldn't be likely to notice. So one of the things I'm about is let's notice it. <laughs> and another example is Evelyn Linder's of Human Dignity and Humiliation Studies Network, of which Janet and Michael are part. Um, this is an extraordinary project, and it, it is also an umbrella group of many, many other extraordinary projects. Okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> but perhaps just you could go on to other people's questions. But hold that thought. I'd like to talk to you more about it after. Well, sure. Thank you very uh, much. <laughs> Honestly, Lovely. just Joe. Uh, I remember you from last time, and I was I was knocked sideways by the things that you were saying. Uh, do you have any remarks now? He does. Um, <laughs> Joe, please, and um, yeah, proceed. Uh, thank you so much. I feel I feel very honored that you remember me. I absolutely loved your presentation. Uh, uh, I love the thing you said about uh, from information, opinion to action, to now attention, action, which is what we are currently dealing with. Because I've also noticed very few people actually slow down to listen to the other person. They're always ready to, to say what they, and this is a behavior, I guess, that we don't notice as a collective, maybe because we all have frustrations and we all feel like we want to be heard, but that's getting in the way of us actually connecting. Because when we communicate, I'm more concerned about putting forward what I'm thinking, regardless of whether it's right or wrong, and you're also maybe doing the same. And so even after a conversation, when we leave it, 
it, uh, we, we, we leave it maybe even worse than when we began because now we're leaving it with even negative, you know, emotions. Um, uh, because I love that you said, I uh, have the, the concept of moment to moment co creation. So, this is where uh, if we actually slowed down, I love the, 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 the information, opinion, action, because opinion implies that somebody's being thoughtful, somebody's actually thinking. And also, when you said that uh, most of what will prevent our extinction must already be happening, be going on underneath, I guess, our awareness. I'm thinking we're losing that because we're not listening to each other. I think we all have parts, we all have parts of the solution and we can collect all those parts if we stop and listen to each other. But if we're all, if we're all just speaking, nobody's really being corrected because we all think we're right. So I absolutely love, uh, I love the whole presentation and also what Janet said that you know, all fighting is obsolete. Oh, I absolutely love that because even just in entertainment, uh, I realized I was thinking about it the other time and I realized even some of our sports need to change. I know that's going to take a long time, but some of our sports need to change because it's like just an example, boxing, it's, it's cool and everything, but you're just getting there to show who can inflict pain and emerge successful. After that, there's no real human benefit beyond that, besides the paycheck, you know. So yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Well, thank you so much. I, you know, this is my first time. I've been working on this book at least for ten years, but uh, I was. Uh, I'll put it this way: I did get some sleep last night, but not very much. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you. Michael, I see Hi. you. You may I mute? I'll mute, yes. Thank you very much, Michael. Hi, uh, Peter, that was just terrific. Thank you so much. It was uh, so uh, coherent, well-organized, and so much that is so out of focus, you brought into focus. And, and the central urgent thing before us all, you brought into focus. It's just a, a wonderful, magnificent presentation. Thank you. <sighs> Thank you so much. Um... Michael and Francis, would you like to go for it? Thank you, George, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Peter, especially for the presentation. What I gleaned from the whole thing, and I want to take you back a bit, it's about uh, the, the neocolonialism after the enthusiasm of getting independence. And uh, now we are almost 60 years. Tomorrow we mark our Independence Day. I think 60 years of independence, and we are so miserable as Kenyans. We are suffering until uh, we don't know what to do. Because each year I'm now 40 plus. Now I've seen we are just going down. And uh, for us, I cannot blame the West too much. I blame our leadership and our insatiable appetite for greed. The greed is too much. Uh, I stayed near Congo sometimes, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and I could see trucks, truck loads getting minerals from Congo, taking to South Africa and to wherever they are going. So this point of greed, and that greed is what took us to slavery. Our, our leaders connived with those of the West. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much for that. I'm, um, it reminded me that there is a, an incredible book has just come out. It's written by Alicia Deva. I'll put it in the bibliography. Um, she spent about 30 years, uh, she ran away from Stanford or some institution of higher learning 
because of the sexism in politics. And she has researched this and says that there was an old Europe civilization, which was matrilineal, was mother oriented. There was no war. And several thousand years ago, people from the Russian steppes came and raided old Europe, killed the women, or killed the men, took the women, and started the civilization that we call it now, which is completely based on conquest, and immediately went to enslavement and colonial uh, operations, and has ever since. So as soon as the word blame comes in, we're looking for somebody we can we can get. <laughs> but that person died six or seven thousand years ago. And we are dealing with uh, a set of a, a world view, a view of life in which we think it is natural law to kill or be killed. And it is not. And now the paleontologists and the anthropologists are discovering that it is actually the aberration is all the killing. And normal is big families. Nobody cares who the father is. Everybody's got lots of mothers. And there's peace. So it is not hopeless. It's in our DNA. Now, I'll, I'm going on. Is any, are there any more questions that I'm interrupting at the moment? <laughs> because um, I want to address moment. this. Uh, Francis has brought up a really important thing. Uh, there's, there's a Four Arrows and Darsha Narvaez have teamed up and written uh, Restoring the Kinship Worldview. I'll put that in the bibliography as well, um, which is actually 28 precepts from elders of uh, indigenous people. Uh, the indigenous, uh, let's see if I can find it. I'll share my screen. I'll have to do a little search. Oh, I'm in the wrong one. No, I can't find it there. But this is worthwhile to to look. Uh, there we go. Nope. So there are basically two worldviews now. And she was sorry. Well, at any rate, um, Four Arrows holds that there are two worldviews predominant in the world, and he calls them the colonial and the indigenous. And the indigenous worldview um, 
Oh gosh, I wish I could find this thing. The, maybe uh, we can come to it later. Yeah. Well, basically, the mm -hmm. indigenous worldview uh, is all inclusive. And uh, Four Hours has this wonderful list of you know comparing these two worldviews. But where people uh, in the dominant worldview regard the earth as resources to be exploited, indigenous people regard everything as their their cousins. The birds and trees and rocks are related and to be respected. And in fact, to be spoken to and listened to. And nice. uh, this is this is now the other thing that's so important is the work of Dr. Ian McGilchrist, who has put together all of the research on the two halves of the brain. And it turns out that the left hemisphere is very much like the dominant worldview now. And the right hemisphere is very much like the indigenous worldview. It's much more contextual. It doesn't speak, it's, but it certainly listens. So what McGilchrist says is that the right hemisphere takes in the world as it is, and the left hemisphere takes that and constructs a catalog, basically. And then the left hemisphere forgets that there's anything that's not in the catalog. So, it, you know, it sees a bird and it's got to look it up <laughs> to see if, if it's a real bird, you know. <laughs> These two worldviews are in conflict. And the vast majority of people in the world now are of the indigenous view, but they're not as well armed. <laughs> I was talking with uh, Mazin Kuncier in Palestine and introduced him to Hector Aritzizabal in Colombia, who was living in the jungle with a lot of indigenous people. And uh, they spoke for about five minutes and just made this connection that, you know, the, the dominant worldview is smaller, but noisier and heavily armed. So it is, I glean from this in a circuitous way that we can actually abandon all this evil. It's, you right. know, we don't have to defeat it. We, we can put it down. We can put it down within ourselves to begin with. And there is so much work going on now, huge groups of people and online, billions of people face to face in real time, whose focus is specifically abandoning that, that evil within ourselves. So eventually, you know, it'll be that old saying, if they, if they threw a war and nobody came. Right, there is a, actually there are a couple of questions in chat. And one mm -hmm. is from uh, Hekima in, in Nairobi. And um, this uh, participant says, I wonder has our reflection or thinking been dominated by passive phenomena that appear attractive and control our perceptions and behaviors. From Hipsa, I don't know whether you can see it. Uh, yeah, chat. let's see. Our short-sightedness does not appear to pay attention to the possible future outcomes. And, oh, it doesn't have audio. Welcome the idea of attention this raises many questions about structured or formulaic attention, research methodology. Excellent. Uh, McGilchrist points out that there's two kinds of attention and they go with the left and right hemisphere. So the left side of your brain controls the right arm and it grasps things. 
and it grasps concepts. And it tries to control and manipulate because this is how we get food. So that side of my body and, and the opposite side of my brain are only concerned with what I can get and whether I can eat it or, or some other basic bodily function. The other side attends in a different way. But McGilchrist points out that the word attention means reach out and touch something. Reach out a hand to it. So now if I put that on the right hemisphere, which is contextual and watching the big picture while the left side is trying to find some food, my attention Let's try something. This is a very interesting exercise. Everybody just uh, just sort of sit up straight and focus your attention on, I don't know, your nose. Or, you know, where are you? I'm here. Focus on here. And where is your foot? Well, it's, it's there, right? Now focus on the walls of your room, but don't lose sight of your nose. And then focus on the outside of your house. You can just bring your awareness outwards, go out a little bit more. Maybe you can see, you know, if you're good, you can see the Eiffel Tower from here. Now what you're doing is you're operating both hemispheres. The one is focused on here and the other is focused out in the field. This is actually normal function. We're trying to get a piece of food with one side and we're watching for predators outside, out far away. You cannot do both with one brain and survive. This is why all nervous systems in all animals, including flatworms, have divided brain. Now, what did I, did I address this question? Attention, research methodology. Um, this is really interesting because academic work really requires concentration on my nose, <laughs> you know, on my typewriter, on my keyboard, on my book. And at the same time, it restricts our thinking to thinking, which is very largely done in this limited realm of what can I grasp and what can I do with it? And you'll notice that really great academics have this other thing going on. Um, McGilchrist points out that great mathematicians, almost all of them have asserted that beauty comes first. A beautiful, I had a connection problem. I think you can hear me. I have a, a mathematician has a beautiful thought. Einstein has a beautiful vision. He sits down at the piano. Einstein used to do this. He would play the piano and then he would go and write out these equations. Oh, E equals MC squared. He knew what that sounded like before he knew how to write it down. I don't know if that got anywhere near the question. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And uh, um, I can see that uh, Joe has a hand up. Joe, would you like to ask a question or make a comment? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I have, well, yeah, I guess it's a question. I was, I was wondering if, if it's possible to imagine an ideal, right? 
because because I notice, I mean, we're very good at identifying what's wrong, right? And so now I was wondering if we can approach peace uh, idealistically, like once we identify maybe an area that's wrong, then imagine it working perfectly, regardless of what stands in the way of that perfection. And then we work from there. So essentially it's like, can we reverse engineer peace based on what's going wrong now? <laughs> oh, brilliantly put. I, I would say that you're speaking about possibility. I'm going to turn down the sound on this other thing. Um, we can deal with what is predictable, and that's always based on what's wrong. Because, you know, as a little tiny child, the first thought is like, something's wrong. Something's wrong with me. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so the predictable is always based on what's wrong the possible is another thing and if we can think of possibility as not like uh maybe tomorrow i'll i'll get a paycheck you know that's possible right that's really about an option or a, or you know a probability but a possibility has no it exists right now. So I, Rilke said something like, I, uh, I, I live not in uh, the future, but in a possibility that may become reality or something like that. Um, so it's very effective to create possibility and to speak it, and just as you're saying. And I heard you do it last time too. <laughs> it's, it's not uh, in the ordinary lexicon. People don't quite talk that way because it's so much easier to see what's wrong. <laughs> but yes, exercise that muscle because the possible is, is wide open. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. I would like to um, ask also a question about population, your ideas on population growth, because it's, uh, oh. you know, seen as <laughs> one, of the, one of the evils that, uh, you know, cause problems in, in the world. And so population should be contained. And uh, so- Well, that, your, that your thought, squeeze. the contained thought is the deadly one. And the whole field of pseudoscience called eugenics achieved escape velocity when Darwin's theories came out. Darwin was infected himself a little bit. Um, I personally know someone whose mother was injected with plutonium in the 60s in a hospital by a person who last I checked, is the head of that hospital today. Um, the idea that, you know, that, that there are disposable people arises out of this so quickly, <laughs> you know, oh, there's too many of us. Uh, let's draw lots and see who gets to get in the water. You know? <laughs> now, if we speak possibility, if we, if, you know, when we create possibility, just in our thinking, it affects our behavior. Without, you know, it, there's no delay, there's no opinion in between the possibility and how we act on it. We act on what we see. And what we see isn't necessarily real in any case. Anything in your attention is real enough for you to act upon. And if you're not careful, do some crazy stuff. So population technically is not a problem. It's well understood now that we could feed everybody on the planet and probably twice as many of us. 
if we will. So it's back to this colonialism thing, which allocated humanity to some people and not to others. And then they could dispose of the others. And, and you know, I was, cousins of mine in England were a family that produced all the beer. And as a result, my cousin was the Lord High Chancellor. And a couple of years ago, I went there to a reunion of that fa- branch of the family. And they took us on a tour of Windsor Castle. And I walked into the door and it was like hitting a wall because I looked up and 50 feet of wall going up to the ceiling, completely covered with rosettes made of swords that were stuck up on the wall. And everywhere you looked, there were exotic jewels and exotic sculptures and exotic fabrics and exotic furnitures and it was all stolen with those swords it was the, the there's 20 miles of corridors filled with the plunder of the world and it's in the queen's residence the king's residence now like A hundred yards away, when I was there, Queen Elizabeth was walking her dog in the midst of this, you know, just, I was looking at it and I was seeing this blood-drenched castle. (laughs) Um, Where did I, I just got launched on something by that. I don't know what it was. population oh yes well population is a problem if you happen to be in the dominant worldview because in the dominant worldview we have a system that i call scarcity and accounting there's an economist named orleon who who explained that we've been separated from our means of existence, which is each other, and as a substitute, given money and accounting. So by this artificial imposition of a cultural structure, there's not enough of anything, and we keep very careful track of who it belongs to. You cannot have a a world without war and a world without 20% of the people dying of, of disease and poverty and starvation when you live in this world of scarcity and accounting. But the world isn't like that. That's a dream. Scarcity is a dream. It's, you know, but you can't punch your way out of a paper bag. Wish I had a paper bag I could show you. (laughs) Thank you so much, Peter. And uh, Janet, would you like to ask the question you had or is that off the record? Um, um, well, one thing I was thinking about is, well, this is very too abstract maybe, uh, paradigm in worldview, you know, or left side and right side. What, how, like in everyday life, do you have some advice for everyday life for integrating, recognizing? I mean, I think you're speaking to my sense of a a, a relational and intersubjective intersubjective paradigm for peace, justice, and democracy, and and in which the dignity and the respect, as we say with Evelyn too, is 
central. And the relating, as Justice Joe, as you said, is central. And that creates a sense of abundance. So, uh, but I, I, I really agree. People are guided by a worldview and, we and it sometimes boxes us in and boxes out other people and other worldviews. So, okay, paradigm, I think, is like a method. You know, it's, it boxes you into your discipline or whatever. But worldview, it's more like um, our personal intersubjective lived um, positioning in the world. I don't know. So any part of that you could, that was long-winded and I apologize. Any part of that you could uh, expound or, or illuminate would be appreciated. Thank you. That is um, the answer to your question. Put it at the center. Put the respect at the center. Put the awareness that this is the moment. You know, there is no other moment but this. It's, it all comes from, you know, I mean, Practice, you know, thinking about your nose and thinking about the edge of town for a couple of minutes a day. I mean, just to balance your brain together. Um, I mean, I, my only advice is never take advice. <laughs> well, can I, I, now that I started talking again, <laughs> I remembered that what you're describing in this exercise, what you're opening us up to in this exercise is very much the uh, practice of a dancer where you're looking internally, you're paying attention to your movements, but you have this multiple split focus. So you're also relating to music and timing you're relating to the space, you're relating to the other dancers. And when with your within the structure of the choreography, say if you're performing, and at the same time, you're trying to flow your own expressiveness into that. And so it's like a multi-focused, very alive, extremely alive and alert experience and I'm thinking about what you said about listening Joe there's there's an aliveness and a, an extremely uh, sen sentient relatedness so that's what you reminded me of in my from my experience and I appreciate that thank you huh. I think I found it. <laughs> uh, yes. All right, let me share this. All this technology. Whew. Where'd it go? There it is. This is from Four Arrows, who is a Lakota medicine man now and he is in mexico do you see this yes so on you the left it. the common dominant world common dominant worldview manifestations and on the right the common indigenous worldview manifestations and i assert just on my own responsibility that this is also a description of the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Rigid hierarchy versus non-hierarchical, fear-based thoughts and behaviors against courage and fearless trust in the universe. By the way, Four Arrows says that if you're in fear, it is time to practice a virtue. And the example he gives 
is that if you meet a bear, you think about the fact that the bear may want to feed its children and you offer yourself to the bear. And, you know, sometimes the bear eats you and sometimes you eat the bear, but it's practicing a virtue at that moment when nobody I know would ever think of such a thing. <laughs> and Four Arrows tells a story uh, from mythology of the American uh, Indians that uh, these two brothers were approaching this ogre, this monster, and one brother said, I'm a good shot, I'll shoot him with my bow and arrow. And the other brother said, no, that's not going to work. He'll, he'll just catch it. So what do you think we should do? So the other brother said, I think we should sing to it. So they, they walked up to the monster, which was growling ferociously, and they began to sing. And the monster was so confused that it <laughs> didn't eat them. <laughs> so in this wonderful list of 40 characteristics, you know, linear thinking, nonlinear thinking, low respect for women, high respect for women, other than human beings are not sentient. All life forms are sentient. It's, it's an extraordinary piece of work that he teaches to uh, PhD students who need it. <laughs> but this is, this is the kind of thing, you know, that's, if nobody showed me this list, you saw how much trouble I had remembering it. Earlier when I was searching for this and I've got to find this list and then I'll have the answer. <laughs> you know, we live in this world of answers. Like uh, there's, this there's this answer that goes, a woman's place is in the home. Now, who ever asked that question? Nobody ever said, where is a woman's place? No, that, that answer was to the question, why can't women vote? The world that we live in is filled with these answers that are, they're just answers. They have no question. <laughs> they cover up the question. They're like, we step on them to get across the questions and not get our feet muddy. Right. Um, Joe, do you have a question, observation to make? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to add on to what, what Janet was saying. Um, like, uh, uh, I, I just thought as you were speaking, the words that came to mind were being present and aware. That's a thing that, so it's like uh, a lot of our problems come from a lot of us being asleep. You know, and the ones who are awake enough to catch what they need to catch in everyday interaction, they are able to prevent what shouldn't happen from just by being sensible enough. And then a lot of a lot of some of the problems that happen happen because we weren't aware enough to catch them before. You know, so we didn't notice them as they were. Yeah. Wonderful. You don't have to ask questions. You're free to interrupt. <laughs> Everything you say is gold. Um, it, it, we don't stay in one state, you know, like if we talk about how the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere, you never know which one you're in. And if you make up a, a rule, that's probably the left side talking. If you know, I need this list of worldview manifestations. But that's what, that's what the left hemisphere needs. You know, the right is already in, in the presence. <laughs> but we flip back and forth. You can't stay 
you know, you can't stay present and aware. You can practice getting present and aware, but it's not persistent. You can, you can very easily stay not present and unaware. Uh, there's no effort involved in that. It's what that part of the brain does. So we should respect our divisions and we should respect in, in such a way that we can live in complementarity, you know, in harmony. It's the, it's the yin and yo, the yin and yang. Uh, there's a little bit of this in that one, and there's a little bit of that in this one. And they, they interlock and intersect. I don't know how much time is left, but I've had an idea that I would give a little bit of uh, this stuff because uh, a book is from top to bottom, left to right, and all that stuff. You have five But, minutes. Oh, good. Five okay. minutes. Right. So there is a. Let me see. Oh, I got to stop and start to do this, but I can do that. So this one, this is about the catastrophe. And I've made it into a network. And I do this by saying there's three hubs. There's environmental collapse. There's tech-driven paradigm change. It's collective stress response. So this is, you know, ecology imbalance, cascading feedback loops, all that sort of collapse stuff. This is the supercritical network event brings a radical shift to economic markets, but it didn't change the basic cultural structure of capitalism. So it changed the balance of power and it brought in social fragmentation instead of setting us free to have a world that works for everyone. And we have a collective stress response, which is good old fight or flight panic. So if I click on this and go to that, I've got conflicting survival responses, which, you know, I can freeze or I can run away or I can run toward the threat because it might be safer over next to the lion, you know. <laughs> I can have uh, addiction. Addiction is part of the trauma and abuse cycle. And denial is also. So now if I go to, back to my three hubs here, These things are all interrelated like this. Now, this is a diagram of a network. So here I have industry. I got petrochemicals, agriculture, electronic systems, global overheating, the internet are all connected to industry in the way that I've set this up, right? Uh, and along with the internet, I've got neuromarketing algorithms in social media, which are part of the attention mining industry, which uh, anticipated return on investment, surveillance capitalism, You see how all these things are interrelated. Now I want to go one more step to, oh, let's see, this guy. I call this Rubik, just it's a file name, but basically Rubik's Cube is a puzzle that you solve one face of it 
it unsolves the one next to it because they're so interrelated. Here we have our environmental collapse, carbon emitting fuels, the oil war economy, you know, the accelerating bio biosphere collapse. Now, instead of just three items under hub one and three under hub two, I've got some of some of the ones from another hub. So virtual audience replaces information. Well, that's node five, so that would be probably under hub two, right? <laughs> but they're interrelated now. So if I do the graphic on this, we have, well, that's not too complicated. So let's see if we have an even worse one. Let's see now, what did I do with this? No, it wasn't that one. But you get the idea when you start mapping out the connections with all these things, it gets really complex. In fact, let's see. Have I even got that one here? Well, I'm disappointing myself because <laughs> I have a uh, I have a fabulous I'll just do it with this one. Oh, got to stop and start. One of these days, I'll be the absolute master of these things. But this is how these networks grow. Now you could think of this as a map of brain cells, or you could think of this as a map of airports or viruses or, you know, everything has these kinds of properties. And now it's become possible to, to actually understand and predict the behavior of these things to a certain extent. But you can see that if I focus on this item and, you know, I fix this one, it's going to change the other ones. Everything around it is affected. So that's really what we're up against when people come to you and say, we have to uh, feed the hungry. Well, good. Let's go over here and find some hungry people and, and feed them. Well, notice the forces that are in play that we can't see. All we see is this one item here. And we'll try and try and try. So when I was in Nigeria, there were piles of boxes on the street corner of powdered milk. And it was called Kennedy milk. And nobody knew what to do with it because it said on it that it didn't have any fat in it. So the people said, well, what do we need that for? There's no fat. 
And you notice how it snaps back. You try and try and try. Let's have a, let's create peace, right? And then you lose your funding. And back it goes. So the idea is not to be discouraged by this complexity. It's really to respect it. You know, if I if I try something that's not going to be effective, that's going to be discouraging. But if I know about that, I have a different relationship to it. You know, then I can decide whether I should shoot it with an arrow or sing to it. And I pretty much know that shooting with an arrow isn't going to work. <laughs> Thank you so much indeed, Peter, for this brilliant talk. And uh, it's been really amazing listening to you. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you and everyone on this call. And we'd like to invite you again um, next week. Uh, and we'll be talking about recentering indigenous defense systems in countering or preventing violent extremism. So you're welcome again. And we'll be with Hippolyte Pool all the way from Ghana. Ghana is just close to Nigeria. so. Uh, We'll be just moving one country just uh, uh, apart. So thank you very much indeed. All the best. Uh, it's been a great honor. Thank you, sir. And I will be at the next one. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.